everybody uh, it's june 27 2023 uh 5 p.m so we're gonna get this meeting started let's go ahead and i'm gonna go, go ahead and call this meeting to order and stand for the pledge of allegiance please i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with can we confirm we have a quorum, please? Okay. AJ Mosqueda? Present. Ron Rice? Jim Allen? Tim Bowers? Present. Kenny Bryant? Here. Matthias Rosales? Present. Here. Gary Black? Here. Bobby McDermott? Here. Ron Van Wy? Here. Chairman, you do have a quorum. All right, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and read a little uh, script here that I have to read every day, every time I come. If you are parked in the rear employee gated parking lot, please move your vehicle to the front north parking lot to avoid having your vehicle locked in. Please sign in on the sign-in sheet at the table by the real door, rear door, door. Please state your name and address for the record before speaking at the podium. Please address the chairman, not the audience or staff when speaking at the podium. There is a three-minute timer for those who wish to speak. I do have the ability to decide a speaker to speak longer or stop a speaker. If you have handouts to give to the commission, please give them to administration staff. They will distribute to the commissioners. If you show, informa if you show information on the overhead projector, please give them to administration staff to become part of the permanent record. Restrooms and drinking fountains are down the hall behind this meeting room. Please feel free to use as needed. No food or beverages other than clear water in the meeting room. Thank you. All right, item number three, approval of the Planning and Zoning Commission regular minutes of May 23rd, 2023. Chairman. Yes. I move that we um, accept the minutes as presented. I have a motion to accept minutes as, pre accept minutes as presented. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any discussion <clears throat> in regards to this motion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, minutes have been approved. Item number four, minor amendment case number 2302. Adrian Vega from Dahl Robinson and Associates. Staff? Mr. Chairman. Chairman, can you also open rezoning case 2305? They go right. concurrently. I will also open item number five, which is rezoning case number 2305. And I believe uh, Commissioner Scott has a comment. I need to recuse myself from minor amendment case number 2302 and rezoning case number 2305. I'm currently employed by the agent for the owner. Thank you. Noted for the record. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Javier Barraza, Senior Planner, presented minor amendment case number 2302. This is a request to change the land use designation of a parcel that is 2.5 gross acres in size from agricultural rural residential to agricultural industrial. The subject property is located in the Yuma, planning, Yuma Valley planning area, northwest corner of Somerton Avenue and Sunset Street, in Yuma, Arizona, and the intent is to accommodate the rezoning of the subject parcel from suburban ranch to acre minimum to light industrial to acre minimum. This is the land use and visiting map on the subject parcel, parcel 95 of the center of the slide. It is cross-hatched. Uh, land uses on the north are low-density residential, on the west, agricultural rural preservation, as well as uh, uh, on the south, it's the same uh, land use as the existing uh, subject parcel, agricultural rural residential, and to the east, the same land use, agricultural rural residential. This is an aerial view showing the subject parcel outlined in red. It exists in the context how it is developed. This uh, is the slide shows uh, the subject parcel outlined in red showing the existing uh, zonings and uh, existing uses. Staff, staff did not receive any comments from property owners. We received comments with no concerns from uh, Southwest Gas. 
Staff recommends denial of minor amendment case 2302 based on the following. The amendment is not consistent with the existing character of the Yuma Valley planning area. Number two, the amendment does not represent, represent an overall improvement to the plan and will only benefit the land owner. And number three, the amendment does not address an oversight, inconsistency, or inequity. I will now present rezoning case number 2305. Same, this is a, a request to rezone the subject parcel, which is 2.5 gross acres in size. From suburban ranch two acre minimum to light industrial two acre minimum, the intent of the applicant is to establish a contractor's yard for an excavating company. <coughs> this is the zoning and vicinity map on the subject parcel, highlighted in red and cross hatched. Parcel is accessed along uh, Somerton Avenue on the east, which is a paved road. Parcels on the north are zoned MHS 20 and R120, uh, with a mix, improved with a mixture of manufactured homes and site builds. Parcel 36 on the northwest is zone R120, improved with a site build. Parcel 34 and 35 have in ag are in ag use and residential use. Parcel 96 to the south is zone suburban ranch two acre minimum, improved with a manufactured home. Parcel 97 also to the south is zone light industrial, improved with a manufactured home. Parcel 14 to the south is, is zone General commercial improved with a depot. It's like a farm labor buses and workshop. Parcel 41 and 64 to the east are zoned general commercial. Parcel 41 is the uh, it's owned by the applicant and is used like in a storage uh, yard area for the excavating business. Parcel 64 is improved with a site built dwelling. Parcel 47 is the location of the Yuma West Trailer Park, zone MHP. Parcel 46 to the northeast is on local commercial in <coughs> with a site built dwelling. And parcel 65 further north is, is in ag zone general commercial. And this is an aerial view showing uh, the subject parcel outlined in red. We, on the uh, right, you can see the different uh, labels with the different uses on the east. This is a view looking north at Summerton Avenue from uh, the front of the property. Now looking south, this is a view looking west of the subject property from Somerton Avenue. Looking east from the center of the subject parcel towards the east. Now west from the center of the subject property, looking west. No comments received from property owners within the notification area. Again, so with gas, got no concerns. Staff recommends denial of rezoning case number 2305. If the Planning Commission recommends approval, staff suggests attaching the following performance condition. Within 60 days of approval by the board, the owner in shall uh, do the following. Provide an ARS 12-1134 waiver, record an infrastructure disclosure statement, record a range disclosure statement, and record an agricultural disclosure statement. Mr. Chairman, this concludes staff's presentation. Yes, staff's ready to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just one question. Is that light industrial just out of the uh, the circle? It's an LI, and I, I'm not sure what that was. Just south of 97? Mr. Chairman, that's a pre-existing, pre-planned. Light industrial was established before the adoption of the comprehensive plan. Okay. Any other questions? Chairman, um, is parcel 41 related? Is that the same business that we're talking about for parcel 95? Mr. Chairman, uh, staff uh, thinks so. The owner is this, this the same as the applicant. I mean, the request was made by the owner of that property. Can you, can you put up the aerial image again? So that, so parcel 41, which is a contractor yard, that is currently commercial, not light industrial? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions from commissioners? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, staff, you're recommending denial based on the fact that it does not conform to the comprehensive plan. Is that what you're saying? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, just for clarification, if the minor amendment is approved, then the rezoning will be in compliance with the comprehensive plan. But staff is recommending denial of the minor amendment because it, uh, the 
character of the proposed land use is uh, different. The proposed change is different than the character of the surrounding area. The property is uh, surrounded by uh, mostly residential land uses. The industrial land uses or zoning districts that are present uh, in close proximity to the subject property were established prior to the adoption of the comprehensive plan. Go ahead back to the aerial again. So right now, and excuse me if I missed this, I put the papers over here. What is the zone right now? The subject parcel? Yeah. Suburban ranch, two acre minimum. So we're saying that if a two acre house is more conforming to all the stuff in the front that's commercial and all that stuff. That's what we're pretty much saying. Uh, that is correct, Mr. Chairman. And it is uh, also the zoning, the current zoning SR2 was, is also pre comprehensive plan. So. Right. Mr. Chairman, yes, Mr. Uh, one question. Uh, what uses would the, the property have if we, uh, if, if we changed it to the what, light industrial? What uses would we have? Mr. Chairman, uh, all the uses allowed in the light industrial. A couple seconds. No worries. <clears throat> Alan, right there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to start with the permitted uses administrative and professional offices, airport facilities, apparel, clothing, and other product manufactured from textiles, animal boarding or auctions, veterinary or hospital or kennels, automobile repair, automobile accessory stores, and tire sales. Building material sales yards, including sales of aggregate rock, sand, gravel, contractor sales and equipment yards, heavy equipment sales, rental and repair, convenience store or mini mart, and I can ice and cold storage plants, manufacturing including processing, assembly and or packaging, medical centers, doctor offices, moving and storage businesses, printing newspaper, publishing and binding, production and marketing services related to agricultural production, rental equipment yards, restaurant facilities, retail lumber yards, swap meets or other open air sales, warehousing and storage facilities, wholesaling and distributing operations, utility substations, wireless communication facilities. I will be back. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the commissioners? Hearing none, I'll invite the, uh, open it to the public. I'll invite the applicant up to comment or. Uh, so, so I'm Doyle Bodine, I'm the property owner. Um, this the subject property, property we've owned, I've owned for well, some time, um, about a year, I'm guessing, something like that. We've left it fallow. We haven't done anything with it because um, we know that, it, that that the zoning that's there doesn't doesn't allow for us to be able to store our equipment there or do anything with it. Um, we bought the property hoping to be able to rezone it so that we can um, expand our yard, that, which is right across the street, to use this property for the same purpose. Um, when we when we had. When we built, when we, when we developed the property we're on now, the first thing we did was to, we put a six foot block wall between us and, and all the residential property around us. We plan to do the same thing with this property. Um, our, our planned use is just to use it however we need to, to be able to put equipment on it. Um, usually our equipment comes and goes, it doesn't just stay there. Um, uh, and and we, may, we may store some materials there, that kind of thing. Basically the same use as you look at the uh, as the contractor yard there in that in that picture, um, it, that would be pretty consistent with really what's what's around there. If if you look at the property that's south of us, um, where the, where the it's hard to tell in this picture, but um, across from where it's where it's calling the bus depot there, that that property is they 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 sell um, it's it's its own light industrial and they sell. Uh, mobile homes and old old stuff like that out of there. Um, there. There's no 
high end uses to any of the any of the property around there. Most of it is is mobile homes, and um, you know I know that the said county's had problems with that with that area being out of zoning and out of compliance with all kinds of different things. But we we want to um, to make sure that we're in compliance with the with whatever regulations that are in in the county. Um, we would basically do like I said with the same the same thing with this yard. We would grade it off. Um, put uh, gravel on there so we could drive in and out without getting stuck. And basically it would just be an open art. Some, sometime down the future, perhaps we would build maybe a shade or something over there, but we have no plans for anything like that right now. All right. Thank you. Now, is, uh, staff, uh, is there a reason why we're not, he, is he doing light, are you doing light industrial because that's what we've been, needs to be done or could it be the commercial? Like the one well, we, the we've been told that, that, that that's what we need, that's what we need to, to, to zone it was light industrial. And and that and we we did that partially because some of the property net bias is is already zoned light industrial. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one one question. Uh, so you're going to put a barrier all the way around it, a block wall barrier. Yes, or six foot block plan? wall. Yes. So you'll have barriers between the residential and uh, all the other properties around there. That's that's what I need to know. And I understand that the that the zoning, some of the zoning is there was happened before the zoning plan that has that it that is now but but the, the reality of it is that we're most of that property is being used as you know for those zoning don't zoning uses and so what we're doing really is is not um, far off from what the, what the surrounding right. property is being used. Okay. thank you mr. chairman yes oh. what um, first off we need your address for the record and oh, it, my address is 2258 South 42nd Avenue in Yuma. And my question is, um, you bought that property knowing you could not put anything on it, right? You, you were aware of that when you first... When I bought it, I knew that it was it was zoned R2. With the hopes of rezoning. Mr. Mr. Bryant? So you're, you're wanting to use this just to store your construction equipment? Exactly, yeah. We're just running out of room in our, own, our existing... And to staff... To store construction equipment requires light industrial. Is that accurate? No, no, no other zoning category lower would would allow con storage of construction equipment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that will be one of the permitted uses in the light industrial zoning. Heavy industrial intensive that probably will allow it also. So if there were farm tractors, he wouldn't have to have light industrial, right? But since they're construction say, tractors, RA. that's different. I, that is correct, Mr. Chairman. Hmm. Good point. Weird. <laughs> That's all my questions. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else from the public that would like to speak for or against this item? Hearing none, bring it back to the commission. Any additional discussion? Mr. Chairman, the the, um, the character of that area over there, I think actually doesn't deny this you know i think if if you've got a use on it that is usable uh, you know i think it, it's it's a it's a good thing for the neighborhood really okay. because because you're you're utilizing the, the the property at that point chairman yes i i i don't disagree with commissioner black i think it's times like this that put staff into a really bad situation right um they're comprehensive plans says it shouldn't be there but when you drive through the neighborhood it doesn't seem to fit the comprehensive plan uh in a comprehensive plan is a plan is it can be changed it is not set in stone and but well, i understand why yeah. it puts staff in a bad situation. right no i get it too. Yeah. right, right. And, uh, mr chairman yeah. we went through this uh last meeting i think at the foothills going into uh, a commercial property that that it's changed so quickly and residential they don't want residential they wanted commercial i believe I, I don't remember all the details but but you know i think this this uh this property uh, honestly i think in that area specifically i think it's a good use with that said mr black do i have a motion for item yes, number four minor amendment case number 2302 first? yes Mr. Chairman, I'll give you a motion to recommend the approval of minor amendment case 23-02. And I'll second it, Mr. Chairman. So I have a motion. I have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Nay. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. 
So then this brings us into rezoning case number 2305, which with the approval of minor amendment case, we are in compliance with that, that item. So do I have uh, any discussion? I will open this up to the public as well. Anyone from the public for rezoning case number 2305? Seeing none, bring it back to the commission. Do I have Mr. a motion? Chairman, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend the approval of that also. Okay, so I have a motion for approval. Do I have a second? I'll second that. We have a second, multiple seconds. So any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Aye. Okay, Mr. Motion. Chairman, yes. uh, can I clarify the motion? Does it include the performance condition uh, recommended by staff? As, yes, clarify. Yes, yes, yes. as always. Correct. As presented, yes. All right, thank you on that. Next item of business is tax amendment case number 2301, tax amendment to the Yuma County Zoning Ordinance, Recreational Vehicle Subdivision Zoning District. Staff, Mr. Barraza, is that yours? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Maggie. Council. So this is a uh, text amendment case number 2301. It is a proposed uh, text amendment to section uh, 609.02 and 609.04 of the Yuma County Zoning Ordinance. <coughs> Uh, the reason uh, for the proposed tax amendment is, um, uh, as stated in the slide, the slide before you, uh, it has been brought to staff's attention uh, that stakeholders hold the following view. Yes, zoning, which allows two dwelling units per 6,000 square foot lot, is no longer useful to current developers. Neighbors and elected officials are leery of approving RVS zoning requests due to the remote possibility of 14 dwelling units per acre, and developers have attempted to alleviate these concerns through deed restrictions, allowing the storage of a recreational vehicle on the home site, but not the occupancy. But a zoning revision would be more appropriate. And these are the comments that were received. So um, section 609.02 of the zoning ordinance, uh, section A is proposed to be amended. What's shown before you is text in bold is a new text that is proposed to be added and then text in strike through format is text that is proposed to be deleted. Again, uh, section 609.04, uh, the uh, wording in bold font is uh, wording that is proposed to be added to the Yuma County Zoning Ordinance. Mr. Chairman, that concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you. Any questions from the commissioners to staff? None. Uh, is this one open to the public? Yeah. Mr. Ask. Chairman, then there are several uh, individuals here to speak. Okay. All right, cool. I will open this up to the public. Uh, anyone from the public would like to speak on tax amendment case number? Uh, that says cast. Uh, cast <laughs> case number 23-01. Please state your name and address for the record, sir. Thank you. Have them stuff here for you guys. So I was, uh, I was at home relaxing, you know. Mr. Retired. Chairman, um, he needs to say his name and address. Juan Leal Rubio, P.O. Box 4961, Yuma, Arizona, 8536. So I was home, retired, you know, relaxing. You live in a P.O. box? I'm sorry? You live in a P.O. box? <laughs> That's my address. <laughs> it feels some like it some sometimes. Some people can. You it know, feels like it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so then I saw this uh, this amendment. It, I was looking at the agenda. I was like, what? And I, I saw the, it's a, it's a minor change, but it could have a drastic effect in the foothills. And I'll I'll tell you why, based on um, my analysis and my view of the foothills, how it's grown over the years. So I was looking at the, uh, the purpose of the RBS zoning district, which reads, the purpose of this district is to provide orderly development of subdivisions accommodating recreational vehicles and, and manufactured homes, as well as manufactured homes. We know that it allows, you know, it allows site built homes only, but the purpose ever since this zoning district was created back in the 70s, five, six decades, it's, it was intended for RVs and manufactured homes. And that little 
extra RB hookup. So looking at the stakeholder views, which view number one, the current RV is zoning, which allows two dwelling units per, per 6,000 square foot part lots, is no longer useful to current developers. So under that, under this new proposal, parcels in the RV as zoning district will have to be no less than 6,969.6 square feet net, which excludes rights of ways and common areas, retention basins. And limited to one dwelling, either a site built, manufactured home, or RV, only one. A parcel with a size of no less than 6,969.66 square feet could be, some may think that it could be best used to accommodate a site built dwelling unit. And that has been the trend. Since uh, development trends proved that a parcel of this size can, could be seen as unattractive unattractive for a property um, owner or developer wishing to install a, an RV or manufactured manif home as a principal dwelling unit. A typical RV you see has an average size of 200, 320 square feet and um, is less than 399 square feet, a part model included. Similarly, an overwhelming 60% of uh, parcels intended for the installation of manufactured homes in Yuma County our zone MHS 4.5, which is a 4,500 square foot lot. Based on this analysis, we can assume that a site built homes will typically be built on bigger lots and RVs and mobile homes will be installed on smaller lots, okay? Based on, based on these trends. Under this new proposal, RV lots in the foothills planning area could potentially be eliminated. A good percentage of the foothills planning area is already zone RVS. In fact, one third of the foothills is zone RVS, 31.12%. Uh, for six decades now, the RVS, RVS zoning district has allowed for good orderly growth in the foothills and has offered its citizens, uh, residents, including right, retirees, the housing opp opportunities that they seek, which is to live in a site built home, a manufactured home, or an RV on a permanent basis or temporary basis and have that extra RV hookup for guests or family. It's worked well. The intent to allow only one dwelling unit, site built, manufactured home, home, or RV, on a minimum 6,969.6 square foot parcel could be best accomplished by the creation of a new zoning district versus modifying the existing RVS zoning district, which could potentially eliminate the opportunity for developers uh, that want to accommodate RVs or manufactured homes. The commission or board and board should, should uh, consider leaving the existing RV as zoning district as is. So Yuma County can continue offering this development opportunity for to future developers who seek to promote subdivisions accommodating RVs as well as manufactured homes with that extra RV hookup. That's been the attraction to uh, people that live in the foothills. You know, I want to have that extra, extra uh, RV hookup. And it has served the, the, the needs of the federal residents well for all these years. It's good to note also, I don't know if you're aware, that uh, the city of Yuma, the RVS, RVS zoning district was actually adopted by the city of Yuma uh, council into the, the, the city of Yuma uh, code, and it mimic, mimics the Yuma County zoning, uh, the Yuma County RVS zoning district, and had, had been used continuously uh, on new development within the city of Yuma municipal boundaries that abut the foothills planning area. So it works well that the city says, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna do the same thing. And, and the RVS zoning district is being used by the city also. So that's stakeholder review number one. Any questions? Are you familiar, uh, Mr. Chairman? Are you familiar when the last subdivision was built that, uh, that, that wasn't deed restricted out of using an RV as a residence? My, uh, I can't think of any right now, but I'll get to that. Okay. I'll get to that. Take, take uh, stakeholder view number two. Neighbors and elected officials are leery approving RV zoning requests due to the remote possibility of 14 dwelling units per acre. Yeah, that's, that's some high density. However, the foothills is the most urbanized planning area in unincorporated Yuma County with a third, 31% of the entire planning area zone RVS. In fact, the RVS zoning district 
is the most predominant zoning district in the foothills planning area. It's it, it, that's the one that exists more of any other uh, zoning districts, and I, and I included the uh, the little table that shows, you know, the the different zonings in, in the foothills planning area. A typical RBS zone uh, subdivision in the foothills planning area already has a density of 14 dwelling units per acre, so you already have that density. Yet overall, the foothills is seen as a thriving community, serving the needs of seasonal residents, retirees, and acting as a bedroom community for many Yuma County residents. And as stated previously, it has provided for good orderly growth for many decades now. Development trends prove that urban areas that have adequate infrastructure in place should promote this type of density, 14 dwelling units per acre or higher, to avoid urban sprawl. This is actually good. RBS is pretty good, and, and high density zoning, it actually works good in, in, in uh, urban areas. And this this because they avoid urban sprawl. Many communities in Arizona, including the city of Yuma, have been promoting higher density residential areas by allowing accessory dwelling units. So uh, the city now allows accessory dwelling units, that second little guest house, by right. You don't have to even get a special use permit. And the reason for this is because because they see that uh, in the urban core, and you can could, you could look at the foothills as an urban core because it's an urban area. Um, you know, we have a lot of benefits that we see. Some of these include higher density allows for maximize, maximizing existing infrastructure, infrastructure, which translates to preserving ag lands and open spaces. So you don't have to go out and you know, develop more land because you have more density. And also, higher density residential areas increase walkability, housing affordability, housing diversity, rental housing opportunities, among others. So high density is actually good when you have the infrastructure in place. So now we have uh, stakeholder uh, review number three, and this is where we get into deed restrictions. Developers have attempted to alleviate these concerns through deed restrictions, allowing the storage of, of a recreational vehicle on a home site but not the occupancy, but a zoning version would be more appropriate. Well, I mean, just to clarify, RVs are already allowed to be stored on any property as long as the principal dwelling is, is established. So, yes, zoning laws are best used to regulate land use, space usage, and density among other development standards, setbacks, height. Deed restrictions are best used to regulate aesthetics, home color, landscaping, fencing, stuff like that. It is never a good idea to use deed restrictions on a property zone RVS to not allow an RV or mobile home as a principal dwelling unit and to limit that extra RV hookup because you are changing the intent, the whole intent of the RV zoning district is to accommodate RVs and mobile homes. By adding this deed restriction, it's no longer the intent of that district. That's why I'm saying come up with a new zoning district instead of changing the RVS. If it's not working, then come up with a, new, a, a variation of the RBS, but leave the existing RBS intact because it works. It's been working for many decades now. So um, additionally, deed restrictions are actually con contracts be made between property owners, the developer, and other property owners living in a subdivision. As time passes, these, these deed, restri deed restrictions are harder to enforce if the homeowners association is no longer, no longer active and or the properties are transferred to new, new uh, owners over the years. So imagine, 10 years from now, stuff that's being approved right now or that was approved in the past that, that use uh, deed restrictions to not allow an RV, even though it's zoned for RVs. So now you have a different, no, no active homeowner association, new property owners, and they come in and ask, it's zoned RVS, can I install an RV? Well, it's allowed in the zoning district but it's not allowed in the, in the deed restriction. It's not allowed because of the deed restriction, but who's enforcing it? So then you start seeing, you can see a battle between property owners, and it's not actually a good idea. So if a developer wishes to develop a subdivision, which will allow one dwelling unit, either a site built, manufactured home, or RV, on a minimum 6,969 square foot parcel, this could be best accomplished by the creation of a new zoning district, a new residential zoning district that can include all these uses and this this density that we you know that you know, staff or stakeholders want to see. 
the commission board should consider leaving the existing RV zone district as is and explore the option of creating a new residential zoning district to serve the needs of new housing market and trends in Yuma County. So that's my take on this. Do you have any questions? Detailed, at least on my part. In the future, I would appreciate it if you bring it. Sorry? In. in the future, it would be easier if you bring this to us sooner. I apologize. Actually, oh, I, wrote this, I, I wrote this uh, today. Just to see if your memory's improved any. Do you remember the last subdivision that allowed? Uh, I do not, uh, Commissioner. However, um, I mean, you can't, the, the best way of approaching this, if the, there's a new housing market trend, Create a new district. Leave this one in place. There's going to be future developers that do want to develop RVs, that still want to tend to retirees, and people that want to have that extra RV hookup. So if if the board ultimately approves this, this modification of the RVS district, it's going to change the density of this. So if it does get approved, we also need to change it. Just a side note, you have to change the comp plan to reflect uh, the land use metric to reflect the new, the new density requirement. So that's that's my take. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> my name is um, Aaron Selly. I still don't have an address, so my APN number is seven two eight zero seven zero zero one, and I live out in the foothills. So. Oh, that was fast. Thanks. <laughs> I promise not to take that long, but I put some slides up for you to see some. Um, Do we have a timer or not? Or well, I mean, we didn't use it already, but I mean, I was like, "Is it broken?" Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, you brought time. it up right now. now I'm like, "Oh yeah, we have a timer or not?" Okay. Go ahead. Right. Talk fast. <laughs> okay. I go pretty fast. Go for All it. right. So um, this is just the overview of the area that I want to talk about. I understand that Yuma County is much bigger than this, but this is specifically, I think, what this zoning or rezoning ordinance is going to speak to. So I thought I would just give you a general overview. Uh, Hunter Avenue is there on your west, north obviously 40th Street. Avenue 15E is the east and then west, uh, south is uh, 55th Street. So that's the general area of the foothills that can be kind of developed through the wash area. Next one please. So that's my lot right there. It's at the top edge of 40th Street and the back of the Ironwood um, Drive properties. So. Obviously, this is a big vested interest for me, and this came from the rezoning process that was happening previously. I appreciate the commission's work on trying to get this done because it means a lot to us, the neighbors, and me especially. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this overview slide is a little bit bigger and covers the um, blue highlighted area is the land use code of urban density, which allows between 10 and 18 dwelling units per acre. So you can see that above 40th Street line there is already zoned urban okay so there's not much low density area which is designated in yellow which is between one and six dwelling units per acre there's not much left also note that yellow uh, triangle or square or whatever in the corner over there that's east of 15e is already zoned uh, low density as well so low density is clearly there's not much left out there next one please the red oval is los Barrancas, and it was developed uh, to a much different standard than it was originally laid out as. There's houses that have a driveway in the middle of the yard because it was changed from its original plan. This is backstory information so that it's, it was built over the low density because low density was overlaid on top of the existing um, zoning. So they said that zoning took priorities. So they were able to build that property out that way. The blue oval is the golf course and it was rezoned and redesignated to medium density. Clearly, they were trying to maximize the area in and around the golf course and put in as many houses as possible. But that did affect the low density overall and overlay for the foothills. Next, please. So this is where it gets difficult, right? Because everything in the pink that has the yellow arrows on it right now is zoned RVS. It does not conform or comply to the low density requirements. And if, as stated in the uh, rest of your information this goes through with a may 1st um, if anything zoned after may 1st has to follow these standards almost none of my neighbors do this really only affects me zach black and the owner that um doll robinson associates were previously trying to get rezoned 
And then the golf course is the last RA10, besides me and Zach. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is just a land use conformity matrix. I'm not going to make you look at that. If you can go to the next one, please. But that's the excerpt directly from the 2030 plan. Here it is zoomed in. So low density 1 to 6 does not have an RBS designator in it. So we need to come to terms with a few things. Limiting RBX to five dwelling units per acre requires lot sizes that are too large to develop anything other than site-built homes due to cost of land. That's clearly not what RVS was designed for. RVS was designed to be able to have people of many different income levels and people who are visitors to our winter greatness be able to come in and out of town and be able to park and live from their RV and also have a stick built or um, a manufactured home available to them. RVS also needs to have an urban density component. Next slide. Oh, wait, hang on one second. Sorry. The urban density component is because urban density allows between 10 and 18 dwelling units per acre. So the little graph on the right there, um, I noticed Juan was trying to do some math up there. So my math is a little different than his. But if you take the allowable acreage, I just use a 20-acre parcel. Uh, after getting some more information from the community, I realized my numbers are very small. Typically, you're going to have between 40 and 50 percent allowed for infrastructure. So that leaves a lot size of just over 5,500 square feet, if that's at 30%. Uh, so I think lots are kind of getting bigger because infrastructure requirements have also increased. That's what's made RVS different. Please keep that in mind because just because the developers are hedging their bets and moving towards stick built doesn't mean that that's what RVS was designed for. Next one, please. So let's not limit the dwelling units per acre in zoning regulations, but enforce the land use overall because that's what the 2030 plan is updated much more frequently and has much more community involvement than the zoning regulations. So failed dwelling units per acre uh, maximum would not allow for urban dwelling and RBS zoning it would be um, incompatible with uh, the land use. Many people use RVS as a first time home stepping stone early in life or as a last home option before they retire. I think that's important to keep those people in and around our neighborhoods. RVS keeps the community together by putting people from all walks of life in the same neighborhood. That was the legacy of the foothills, and it's not the city. That's the whole point of it. Uh, many successful neighborhoods have had medium density or mixed use density as well as urban density, so we should allow for that in the future. All right, requests. I request that we revisit the land use designation overlaid on the foothills to address density concerns about the infrastructure. That clearly came out in the last meeting minutes where um, Commissioner McDermott and Commissioner Black brought up specific questions about limiting density. I believe that's important for the foothills and for the growth in the future. Decide if land use, which was imposed later, must be complied with when zoning doesn't match. Because clearly the RVS zoning doesn't match the land use over almost 60% of the foothills besides the golf course. Um, and then number three is require landowners who have no active permits or requested permit. And this is a bigger, this is a bigger question, but require landowners who have no active permits or requested permits or are merely in possession of vacant or undeveloped land follow the new requirements. And I think that that's important because if we have people that are just sitting on land and they already have RBS, but they were zoned 20 years ago, they should have to follow either the land use or the new regulations or both because it's not being developed currently. Next slide, please. Final takeaways, things I want to leave you with before your vote today. Mr. Chairman, uh, pass the amendment in section 609.02, but strike the amendment in 609.04 if possible. I don't know if that's a possibility. It's why I'm leaving it kind of open. But um, if that's not allowed, request the commission revisit the amendments with some urgency to address, to address the urban density. In the interest of creating a more hospital environment to developers, RBS zoning could be rewritten to match other zoning styles. RVS 1.6 or RVS 2.6 would be reasonable. Uh, RVS 1 2.5 would match something like R1, uh, R1 4.5. Require all future rezoning requests to include the maximum number of dwelling units per acre for the project. Now, this is key because this entire thing came out of um, some meetings that we had about the previous zoning, and this was actually my idea to stop some of the sprawl out there. So. Require, requiring the future zoning um, would be the maximum requested, and they could come in lower but not higher. This would relieve apprehension to approve much needed RVS housing. That came out during the stakeholders information that you guys gave at the beginning of this. Neighbors would, be clear, would have a clear understanding of what the project would entail without the added cost to developers to create an extensive site plan. That was the biggest pushback from the previous project. 
This should merely be a policy change internally and updated on the rezoning documentation. I believe that should be very easy to change, and I think you guys can create that pretty quickly. Um, number three, vacant land sitting idle without the designated project or permit should be held to the proposed rule. I think that will go a long way to keeping the foothills in the low density area looking like that. Far too many areas in the foothills will be able to have two dwelling units per lot, thereby exceeding land use density. The proposed change seems to only affect a few landowners in the foothills, which it would seem does not in keep with the intent. And number four, if a developer intends to create a site-built subdivision exclusively, perhaps guiding them towards an R1X rather than RVS as a catch-all. If they want to build stick-built homes, I think my understanding is it would work better as R1. Clearly, I'm a layperson. I could clearly be wrong about that, but I think pushing in that direction uh, would be better. This would assist the community at large and understand the future neighborhood would look like, and it would also be less deed restrictions so the future owners would be clear as to what their lot or land could support in the future. If you had a lot that had deed restrictions and your house burned down so that the next thing you could afford would only be a manufactured home or something smaller that they were unwilling to allow there and your neighbors went and pulled the deed restrictions out that you didn't know about, that's going to create much more hardship for people and using RBS as a catch-all I don't think is the right answer. Next, please. Oh, that's the last one I wrote there. <laughs> so, uh, I have one more that I can The see. end. Uh, the final the takeaways end. there, yeah. so. Yeah, sorry. Um, so things I've learned in this process, uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, um, I've learned a lot through this, and I want to just say thank you all for your efforts to try and change this and try and create something better from something that was clearly uh, needed some updating, I think. Um, I do believe that there are times when the community members, community members would like to bring things to your attention. Allotting some time during regular meetings for a call to the public, I think, would be in your best interest because there's a lot of things happening out there in the foothills that we would generally like you to know. Um, some issues might be able to be addressed directly by the commission or sent back to staff for future explanation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions? Just kind of, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, let me follow up a little bit because if, if I get the just of what you were saying, you're kind of in an opposite position to the last speaker who wanted to make sure that we could have high density in all of Foothills. You would like to go the other way and actually restrict the current parcels that are RVS zoned so that they could only do five dwellings per acre. Did I understand that correctly? Mr. Chairman, yes. Basically, my point of contention is if we change this now, I think we need some level of urban density out there. Can you change to the map with the urban density in the blue? That one, perfect. So I think that urban density is important and it's going to allow Yuma County to grow. I believe that we need to allow RVS to maintain that higher level density when it's appropriate and when it's planned. I do believe that those parcels that are just sitting there vacant right now and are just being sat on with RBS from the old days, if this passes, that they should have to follow that as well. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Can I, can I ask legal a question? I, if my understanding's right, we can't put new restrictions on previously zoned property that would be considered a down zoning because of of legal issues, would you tell us if that's accurate? I'll, I'll defer to Megan. Okay. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, any uh, property that currently currently has uh, RVS zoning would not have to comply if the uh, amendment is approved. Would would not have to comply with the changes that are applied. And the reason for that it could result in a Prop 207 uh, claim. So it's a diminution. It could result in a diminution of property value and uh, a claim against the county could be filed if we proceed in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else from the public? Seeing none. Um, I do got a question for staff. What about, so, so why, we're doing the, men, the amendment, I, I understand why we're doing it, but what is, and creating a new one, as, as suggested from the first speaker, a new zone, a new uh, use, or whatever you want to call it. Mr. Chairman, um, when I initially started working on this proposed text amendment, one of the options was to create a new zoning district. However, uh, it was suggested that uh, the amendment that is before you today be presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission. 
Um, if the commission wants to make changes to the proposed text uh, that is in your staff report, the commission would have to uh, recommend denial of the request. The board would have to deny the request and the process would have to start all over again. Mr. Chairman, uh, to me, uh, that's more logical at this time. It's uh, because, well, density and property, I mean, it's very con convoluted. And it, 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 what happens, what could happen is, is if you, you have all your RVS out there and your initial infrastructure can't handle that density, then you, you, be, you, then you have problems within the, 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 your infrastructure. So I, you know, I think I need a little more, a little more, I don't know, something on it. It's well, not either way. I don't see a solid street here yet. Because I do agree with the comment in regards to the way the trend of the housing demand is, is going now. Yeah, I now. do too. And, and, I'm, and I got to believe there's, in the foothills, there's more vacant land out there than eventually is going to be developed. So where, whether they want to do RVS or they want to mm -hmm. do, I guess what I'm understanding, we don't have a R1 dash rule zoning. Um, that might be the option to create something for the yeah. future and the growth of the community. But again, Mr. Chairman, uh, the current zoning ordinance does have low density residential zoning districts, the R1s, and it also also has also has medium and high density residential zoning districts, which are the R2 and R3 zoning districts. If a property is rezoned to medium density residential, they do have the option of building a single family site built home on a smaller parcel. They don't necessarily have to have uh, attached dwelling units or multifamily dwelling units on R2 and R3 zoning districts. But that's what's creating the, the medium density because we're they're smaller parcels, correct? The R, the R zone in that we have, what are the smallest parcels? Where do they start at? Chairman, the lowest R1 zoning uh, is 6,000 square foot minimum, the R16 zoning district. The R2 zoning district allows uh, parcel sizes of um, four detached dwelling units of um, 4,000 square feet if they are detached again for attached dwelling units. Uh, the R2 zoning district does allow uh, parcels of 3,000 square feet in size. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Let me let me explain a little bit about how this process went to come to this this point because I I was a bit of the spearhead on this and uh, we originally started talking about doing a, a separate or a different zoning category that would allow or limit five dwellings per acre in RV subdivision and. Um, we looking at that and, and then I took the liberty to call a couple of and actually three or four of our county supervisors <laughs> and I got their take I said look what's happening what do we need to do to make RVS subdivision work again and through that process we found out that no one can remember the last time that a RVS subdivision was developed in the Hank Sheckard style of development that style of development where you had a lot and you sold that lot to a consumer and that consumer wanted his friend to come down from Canada and so all of a sudden they had two RVs and then they'd put a home on and then an RV. And it worked really well when you had a developer that sold lots. We haven't seen that developer that sold lots in decades. And if a zoning category don't work for the users, why have it is the question that I got back from well, supervisors. The, why not just amend the zoning category to what works today? And so what worked today was to, to alleviate concerns of elected officials was to limit density because of the infrastructure or lack of infrastructure in the foothills area and to make sure that, uh, that there was still the ability to do RV living 
manufactured housing living, stick built living, but to limit the density to something that elected officials were comfortable approving. Well, Danny, and, and just one, one of my, my thoughts on it, one of the things that, that I always said on this and, and is it's all, all about density. So if you can put that density in there, then you have to build to that density. So, you know, to me, if you're building infrastructure, putting in a, building a subdivision, and you can increase your density by a third, then you have to put in the infrastructure to put that, you know, and so it's more cost. It should be more cost. Anyway, that's my take on that. <laughs> but, so in order to try to, uh, to solve the problem that we had of a zoning category that didn't work anymore, that hasn't been used anymore, trying to eliminate the fight that was pointed out when, when people buy the second or third time and they so, don't know their deed restrictions. Uh, if, you, if you only have one resident, one dwelling per lot, that kind of sums it up, right? But see, that doesn't affect the vast majority of zoning out there in the foothills because most of it is already zoned RVS subdivision. But there's other areas in the county that and as you go over the mountain, mm -hmm. there could be RVS. But I personally don't want, I mean, it, it's no joy for me to see Hank Sheckard's dream ended. I mean, Hank Sheckard had a dream that we wouldn't have a site built area and an RV area and a manufactured home area. His dream was that you put the rich people with the poor people and they all kind of take care of each other. And he was pretty strong on that. But we have to look at what has actually happened. What has actually happened is none of us can remember the last time anybody developed that way. Yeah. Yeah. And so instead of putting pressure on the military to say, gosh, they could be two dwellings per lot on all of this new stuff getting rezoned, instead of putting pressure on elected officials or how are we going to make sure the infrastructure catches up because we're behind. It just seemed to make sense to those folks who were giving me recommendations and we checked with every active developer in the Foothills area. And we checked with every engineer that works with those developers. And all of the stakeholders buy off on this change to the zoning ordinance. So that's how it got here. Maggie was kind enough to, uh, to run it through and uh, we got it here, so I believe that there's no reason to keep a horse that you can't ride anymore. <laughs> and, the, and the two home dwelling units per lot just hasn't been used. So, Mr. Chairman, can I, would you accept the motion? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I move that we recommend approval of this text amendment as Chairman, so I don't know if we closed the public hearing. I don't recall if we closed it. I thought he did. He did. I leave it open all day. <laughs> <laughs> no one, I said no one else from the public wanted to speak, so come back to the commission. Yeah, he did okay. close it. Yeah. Close it again. I'll close it again for the record. <laughs> <laughs> and I will still move that we recommend approval of this text amendment case number 23-01 as I presented by it. staff. Yeah. Okay. I'll second. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion on this motion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any against? All right, motion carries. Thank you everybody for your comments and, and I did learn a lot on this one. I was kind of confused at the beginning, but yeah, I got it now. All right, uh, item number seven, request to initiate text amendment of the Yuma County Zoning Ordinance 623 Dark Sky Overlay District DOSOD. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Javier Barraza, Senior Planner, presenting this request. As you mentioned, this is a request to amend the Dark Sky Overlay District uh, requirement. Currently, the requirement of the Yuba County Zoning Ordinance subjects new development to a lumen cap based on acreage in the DSOD. The intent is to remove the lumen cap in residential zoning districts. These are uh, the Dark Sky Overlay District was adopted by the board March 9, right. 2020. 
and the purpose was to protect and enhance the lawful nighttime use of property and to specify lighting practices and systems that will minimize the adverse man-made light pollution effects of sky glow, glare, and light trespass. After the adoption of the DSOD, staff received comments from construction industry stating that DSOD was too restrictive. After meeting with several members of the construction industry, staff compared Yuma County's DSOD requirements to other 14 counties that had similar codes. The findings indicate that the DSOD in Yuma County is much more restrictive compared to the other counties in Arizona. The proposed changes are a combination of dark sky regulations adopted by other communities and are intended to alleviate the current restrictiveness of the dark sky over overlay district. Uh, in conversations by phone and or email, the representative of those communities survey expressed the effectiveness of their adopted dark sky lighting regulations and indicated that they have the support from the community. Uh, on May 17, uh, 2023 and June 8, 2023, the Yuma County Planning and Zoning Division met with local stakeholders in the electrical and construction industry and discussed the proposed text amendment that we're going to present to you and obtained their input to improve and refine the text amendment to ensure it is effective in protecting the night sky and reducing light pollution. Uh, the proposed changes are shown below. Text that is proposed to be deleted is a strike through and font and, and text that is proposed to be added is in bold. Would you like me to go uh, line by line or just by slide? I will just highlight the, thank you. So at the bottom you have the what's tend to be deleted and added in bold. I would like to bring your attention to the middle of the slide and uh, the new uh, paragraph B, number two. Uh, we added the following language, exterior lighting fixture with output of 1,125 lumens are more required to be fully shielded or more are required to be fully shielded. Exterior lighting fixtures with output ranges of 1,124 lumens or less are required to be partially shielded. The 1,125 lumens in incandescent light bulbs is equal to 75 watt. Uh, again, I will bring your attention to paragraph D1. We added A, a B, C, and, and D. I will uh, bring your attention to since uh, commercial industrial don't have a very, it has a large cap, which is 175,000 lumen per acre. So those developments, commercial industrial don't have that restrictiveness as residential lots. Like in the foothills, we have small lots like 6,000 square feet. So that really limits new development. Uh, we like to mention that the dark sky overlay district is just west of Foothills Boulevard towards the east and the Martinez Lake area. I uh, can show you a map where that Yeah, towards the east. Uh, the red line on the map is the Foothills Boulevard center line, and in gray is uh, the area of the Dark Sky Overlay District. Uh, inside the rectangle on the north is the Martinez Lake area. Back to, <clears throat> and uh, item B of paragraph D1, D in residential and rural zoning districts, outdoor lighting is not subject to a lumen density cap, but is subject to shielding requirements specified under section 623.10B2, which I mentioned before. If it's uh, 1,125 or more, it needs to be fully shielded. And this is the plate uh, Roman numeral 627, which will be removed in its totality. As you can see on the middle of it, agricultural residential zoning district of one acre or less, the cap was 10,000 lumen per acre. Same again, some strike through, some uh, bold text, you know it. Staff recommends initiating a text amendment to section 623.00 as presented. That concludes staff's presentation. I have some examples of what fully shielded is, what partially shielded, that I'll, if the commission would like to see. I have two questions. One is simple. So the 14 other cities in Arizona, is, I'm assuming Tucson is one of them, <coughs> the, that you use as a sample and re restrictions and so forth, or? It included the 14 counties. 14 counties, okay. Maricopa, okay. Yuma. Not all of them? Because I know Tucson has a very strict, uh, so as, uh, ours were stricter than Tucson's areas. Is that, I want to confirm that part. That is correct, okay. sure. So now we're marrying it. Okay. The second is in English, so how much brighter is this going to be? 
Les Bryant. Okay. All right, go, Mr. Bryant. That's all I wanted to know. Because <laughs> I think get phone calls from people, hey, they came out in the newspaper and they're like, hey, we're worried about it, the foothills area. But the way I explained it, I understood it. This is more of a correction, and in regards to development, it's not going to affect the light sky that much. It's more of the requirements. Mr. Chairman, the intent is that it won't, um, it will make it like the community will be okay with it, will be happy with it, will protect the dark sky. Uh, the problem that the, the construction and electrical companies are having right now, when they bring a new development, the cap really in a small lot brings, let's say, you only allow 1,600 lumens, which equals to 75 watt. And then you need like four light exterior fixtures outside your new you know, residence. And then you have to use like 20 watt lamp, you know, light bulbs on all these locations. So that's what's the pushback. Now with this, it's like they can have brighter lights, but they're gonna have to be fully shielded. This will not pollute the dark sky. As long as they stay within the parameters mentioned. So let me make sure. I was a little confused, but I think you cleared <laughs> it up. We start, we adopted a dark sky ordinance that was more restrictive than Pima County. Why did we do that? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, um, I was partially involved in, in the adoption of the dark sky overlay district. Ever, you hardly ever mess things up. I can't believe <laughs> it. <laughs> um, Mr. Chairman, it, it may have been the fact that we, um, some of the wording in other uh, zoning ordinances from other jurisdictions was used and uh, it was not intended or other uh, jurisdictions don't have a lumen cap in residential zoning districts. However, when staff drafted our zoning ordinance or our amendment to the zoning ordinance, we inadvertently, inadvertently put a lumen cap in residential zoning districts. So for example, in the foothills area, if somebody is developing under the current current dark sky overlay district regulations, if somebody is developing a lot that is, that is approximately 7,000 square feet, they're limited to only 60, 1, approximately 1,600 lumens, which is, uh, I think, 260 watt light bulbs. <laughs> Remember, right? On the outside. Well, that doesn't even provide for meeting the building safety requirements of lighting uh, ex Exterior doors, yes. I think I've got that. So, so I mean, it was a massive undertaking, right, to do a dark sky ordinance from scratch. I mean, so it's not, it's not, it's not a, anyone would make some mistakes as they tried to put that together, I'm sure. But nothing you're doing here is intended to make the dark skies harder to see. They're just trying to come into compliance so that builders can build houses, owners can occupy them and the dark sky ordinance the intent is maintained correct <clears throat> further questions hearing none i'll go ahead and open this to the public for the record i look at emperor anyone from the public want to comment on the dark sky hearing none the military has nothing to say the bay has nothing all right, cool. I want to make sure. <laughs> I knew you could get a comment on that. <laughs> Hearing none, all right, come back. I close it. Bring it back to the commission. Um, do I have Chairman, a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that we, uh, that we approve um, Section 623 as presented by staff. Mr. Chairman, uh, the motion is to initiate a text amendment oh. as presented. Yes, as Maggie, as Maggie said. That, <laughs> as Maggie said. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie, tell us what his motion was. Tell, tell me what my motion is, Maggie. <laughs> I got a motion to request uh, to initiate the text amendment by the commissioner. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All right. Motion, we have a second. Any further discussion on that? Hearing none, all of us in favor say aye. 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 Any against? Motion carries. A request to initiate carries. Thank discussion you. and action concerning amendment, amending the criteria for extending the notification area beyond 300 square feet. Where did that come from? All right, talk to me about that one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Maggie Castro. Um, before you, uh, before the beginning, beginning of this meeting, there was a revised memo that was distributed. Uh, what was in the packet was the wrong version of the staff report. So uh, what's before you today uh, in the memo dated May 15th is the 
proposed changes to the criteria for extending the notification area beyond 300 feet. So, uh, in your sl the slide that's before you right now, it lists the current criteria for extending the uh, notification area. And then uh, page two of your memorandum indicates the proposed changes. Criteria for extending the notification area. Uh, the first bullet point is uh, striking uh, out or adding general instead of just saying a commercial zoning district. Oh, I was trying to figure, so extending up to what now? From 300 to what? The maximum uh, notification would be one mile. Is that, so the one mile. And that's one of the things I that's not included in your memo, and I'd like some input on that from you. I saw it somewhere. That's what I'm saying. I saw a mile, but I'm like, okay, we, where did I see a mile? Yes, uh, the uh, state law currently requires that uh, the a notification go out to owners of property within 300 feet of the subject property or the property intended to be rezoned or special use permit or an amendment. Uh, the criteria allows for a notification for extending the notification area up to one mile. Here's a trick question for you, Maggie. How many feet in a mile? Mm-hmm. Oh. Wow. That's a like long radius. Tester, how many square feet in an acre? <laughs> 43,560. There you go. The realtor knows that one. <laughs> that, that's such a broad jump. Yeah, I was going to say 300, 300 to 5,000. 5,000? And Mr. Chairman, like I said, that's one of the things that um, I would like your input on. Uh, I think there are certain cases where you want it limited to maybe a quarter mile and other cases where you want to go up to that mile uh, notification. So if, if the commission has some uh, suggestions on when uh, the, the notification would be extended up to a mile or a quarter mile, three quarter of a mile, half a mile, uh, we can also incorporate those those changes to the text that is before you. But in, in the past, it's been uniform, 300 feet for everything. That's required. Mr. Required. Chairman, uh, staff has uh, used the criteria, and then depending on the location of the property, say it's in a residential subdivision, in the middle of a residential subdivision, or in the residential area, staff has gone up to a mile as far as the notification area. It depends on the nature of the request and, again, the uh, surrounding uses. Mr. Chairman, Chairman. could we do something such as minimum of the 300 feet so we're compliant and then up to, up to one mile to accommodate that, the varying needs? And Mr. Zoning. Chairman, that is the current... Uh, that, that's what she's doing balance. today. I think what... Mr. Chairman, yeah, I think what... Maggie's doing here is trying to get some more guidance so it's not so arbitrary on okay. staff because staff needs to be able to say this is what we're supposed to do. Well, because get convoluted, is it not? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. like we like you did with the dark sky. I mean, have you checked with other planning and zoning throughout the state? What I mean, get some feedback from them in regards to what is their norm for certain issues, requests. Mr. Chairman, I did reach out to the. Uh, planning directors of the other 14 counties, and some of them have criteria, and some of them just limit the notification to 300 feet. Hey, wouldn't it be a case-by-case, case, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, wouldn't it be a, Maggie, wouldn't it be a case-by-case case basis, because there might be restrictions in area, there might be, they might not have enough room in certain areas, I mean, it's going it, to get convoluted, because it's, some aren't going to be, you know, should we go a half a mile, should we go a quarter mile, should we go three quarters, should we, Wait, what should here. we do? Here, here, here's my thought. Staff knows what they're doing in regards to when they see these cases. They have more knowledge and they understand what we need. I would like to see if, if what you're looking for is direction is bring back to us what your suggestion is based on your experience for these items we need so many and let us let us review that and see if the commission agrees and approve those, re, those, those requirements. Unless you're asking us to, you know, Right, we, we need to give them some cover, I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, staff, staff is going to get criticized no matter what they do, you know. Mm -hmm. Right, and right. Going to, I've seen them criticized for being too business friendly and criticized for restricting business till it's dying. <laughs> and so, but 
I mean, is it fair to say that the biggest concerns usually come like this hazardous waste uh, special use permit? Uh, is that the reason we're looking at this now is because of that hazardous waste? That's one of the reasons that this was brought up. Yes. One of the reasons. Yes, and uh, actually the uh, criteria that's on the uh, slide right now, uh -huh. it does uh, take that into consideration. Uh, proposal involves a hazardous waste storage or transfer facility. If there's other uses that the commission would like uh, that the notification area be extended, those uses can also be added to the criteria. Those this are time, criteria to extend, but you still don't have the, the, the amount of the extension would be, need to be determined. Correct. Right, and so proposed loss of land sensitive areas like the, the solar project that was gonna go out and attack and take all of the, the hunters' dreams away. You're trying to catch, the, you're catching that with the criteria. Huh? Yeah. You must have missed that one. Did, did he miss that I one? I think so. I was aiming that one, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he missed all he failed on us again, right? When we had the room full of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's okay. Uh, so, Maggie, do you believe that it would be appropriate to have different distances? I mean, you got to go 300 feet minimum for any thing but if it's going to result in land loss you might have to go a half a half a mile and if it's going to be hazardous waste you might go a mile I mean something of that nature what you're looking for right and that's why using their judgment on those kind of scenarios give us that data and mm -hmm. I guess what you're looking for is direction to go ahead and start that process and yes. then come back to the commission and yes, then review and approve wants it to be yeah. wants it to be uh, reasonable to right. us before right. she goes to all the right. work and Mr. Chairman, like I said, on page two of your uh, staff report is what the proposed changes are. If the commission would like to suggest additional changes or additional criteria, then um, I can bring those back at a future meeting as well. Mr. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Maggie, uh, in other areas I've seen when, when a rezoning is taking place, there's a, a, a sign that's put out in front of the property stating that there is going to be a, a zoning change in that that people can uh, get information from, from wherever. Can you do that in Yuma County? Yes, Mr. Chairman. State law requires that uh, the, a sign is posted on the subject property notifying uh, the public of uh, the change. Okay. And now, do I have any? You, you still haven't put in the distance on here, right? I mean, you're... This is At this time, a staff uh, comes up with a distance based on uh, the the specific uh, use being proposed. If the commission would like a set um, guideline as to when to extend it a certain distance, then we can also include that in, in uh, the proposed changes. Any other additional questions? Mr. Chairman, if you would like staff to work on this, uh, take another stab at it, I can bring this back to the next meeting or next couple meetings. I would like to talk to some people too. So if the yeah. chairman's okay with that, I would be happy with seeing it back up. In Mr. The chairman, I'd make a motion to table this to the next meeting. Continue. 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 I second that. We have a motion to continue the item. We have a second. Any further discussion? To the... Um, July. Oh, we have any meeting in July? Yeah. No, we have a meeting. Yeah. We meet every month. Oh, no. Some Most boards in July go dark. That's what I'm asking. I know last year I think we went dark in July, too. If I remember. No, we have new lighting, remember? <laughs> we have new lighting regularly. Probably. So, okay, just so making sure because it's going to be hot. We have cases in July. We do? Okay, perfect. Because I know sometimes in the past we haven't and we go dark on that. All right, cool. All right. So to the July meeting. So the motion, all in favor say aye. 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 Any against? All right. Next item is item number 10. Mr. Discussion Chairman, can you give me the who made the motion and who seconded? Terry made it and I seconded. Thank you. Are you smiling? <laughs> 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 Take your pick. 
Uh, all right. Item number 10, discussion and possible action to consider amending the 2030 comprehensive plan to incorporate major, minor, and text amendments that were processed during the public information and participation process or prior to the adoption of the plan. Everybody should have received a packet for item, it's just addendum number one, but it should be number 10. Go Thank ahead, you, Mr. Staff. Chairman. Maggie Castro, Planning and Zoning Director. So this is a request to initiate a minor amendment to the comprehensive plan. Uh, the reason that this is being brought before you is that um, last year during the adoption process for the 2030 comprehensive plan, staff was also processing amendments to the comprehensive plan concurrently with the uh, proposed adoption of the 2030 comprehensive plan. So uh, the cases that are uh, on this slide, text amendment 2201, major amendment case 2202, and minor amendments case 2202 through 04 were approved uh, prior to the uh, adoption of the 2030 comprehensive plan. So when the 2030 comprehensive plan w went out for the public review process, the 60-day uh, uh, PIPP, these changes were not reflected in that doc document. At the time of adoption, uh, because these changes weren't reflected, they were not included in the document that was adopted by the board. So now staff is bringing back, uh, like I said, these um, uh, five cases so that uh, staff can amend the documents since these uh, uh, changes to the plan were previously approved by the Board of Supervisors. Even though one is a mi major amendment, staff is bringing back because it's something that they previously approved. Um, and Again, the text amendment 2201 was uh, changes to um, the uh, bicycle routes or the language relating to the uh, Foothills bicycle, bicycle routes. Uh, Major Amendment Case 2202 was a change uh, in the Yuma Mesa planning area, and it changed approximately 160 acres from agriculture rural preservation to agriculture industrial. The case was approved by the board on November 21, 2022. And this is the area where the amendment took place. Minor Amendment Case 2202 was a, a change of a, a parcel a little less than seven acres from agriculture, rural residential to rural density residential. The property is located in the Yuma Mesa planning area and the case was approved on September 7th, 2022. This is the uh, area of the subject property. It's on the southeast corner of County 18 and a half. And urban density residential to urban density residential. The property is located in the Foothills planning area. The change was approved by the Board of Supervisors on November 7th, 2022. And again, the property is located along Fortuna Road and the alignment of County 12 and 3 quarter Street. And minor amendment case 2204 was a change uh, of 80 acres from suburban density residential to urban density residential. Uh, the property is located in the Foothills planning area. The amendment was approved by the board on February 6, 2023. And this is the map and the area it's located, again, off of Fortuna Road and uh, County 13th Street. And uh, the, the recommendation is uh, to initiate a minor amendment 20, to the 2030 comprehensive plan to incorporate these changes that were previously approved. This time I'll bring it back to the commission for any questions and concerns, and that will also open it up to the public as well. Any questions from the commissioners? Anyone from the public would like to comment on this? We got to know from everybody, so let's go. Staff, coming back to the commission. Mr. Chairman, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Gary. 
Now, right, guys, don't fight over right. this. One I of make you a do motion, it. sir. Mr. <laughs> Chairman, make a motion if I may. If I may. A motion. Yeah, initiate, uh, yeah, initiate the minor amendment uh, to the comprehensive plan to incorporate the uh, amendment. The amendment Is cases this? as presented by staff. Perfect. Yeah. We have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right, we got a motion and a second. Everybody's awake now. All right, cool. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any against? Motion carries. Item number eleven. Um, discussion and by the commission and members of the planning director of events attend the current events and schedule for future planning commission meetings. So we have confirmed we do have a July meeting. Thank you. Um, what day? What day is it in July? July fifth. <laughs> I, my mom's birthday is 24, so I might be out of town, so I don't know. Okay? So, uh, my mom is 78 years old. I go visit my mama. Mr. Better, Chairman, better enjoy it, yeah. Yes. Mr. Chairman, at the work session that you missed. I didn't miss it. I was here for half of it. <laughs> at the work session that you were late for, <laughs> we had talked about, and, and I had asked the uh, legal counsel about why we didn't have call to the publics on our agenda, and it was brought up tonight, and I would... Uh, I would like to suggest to you that perhaps we include a call to the public at some place on the agenda just so people can address anything that they would like to say to the Planning and Zoning Commission that we're not dealing with in a public hearing. That is not part of the agenda, you mean? Yeah. Like a regular public? Mm -hmm. I always thought they didn't have it because everything we talk about is always open to the public. We normally open every agenda item, but you're talking about in general, if it's not an agenda item, if they want to bring it up, like so gentlemen. Would you guys want to look at this? Or, I mean, we're having this problem out there because uh, that's how we find out about commission initiatives that we might undertake is is by our customers and what they need us to do. Don't we have a comment box? <laughs> Suggest to I, I closed mine. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I I kind of like the idea that we're here to serve the public, and I would suggest putting a time limit, a very deliberate time limit. Normal, normally, that it'll be the th it's, it would be a three minute time limit, and yeah. then the question is different. People run it differently. Some of them have it at the beginning of the meeting. Other people have it towards the end of the meeting. That is another question. I believe we should have it at the end of the meeting because we don't want to get people commenting on our agenda items. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. That would be my recommendation. Okay. You said it aloud, not me. That's why that was thinking <laughs> that way. So that's good. I will take it into consideration. Sir. All right. All right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Under advisement. <laughs> All right. any, anyone have any events or anything they attended? No? Uh, I did this after morning. Uh, today was a groundbreaking ceremony for the San Luis Port of Entry. We had our governor from Arizona come and uh, Senator Mark Kelly as well, special guest. Uh, great event, great turnout, uh, $330 million. Cool. Did the shovel breaking today. And I thought about it because I was in the break room back there, back there and I saw the shovel picture that they have back there from I don't know what year it was. And I'm wondering if anyone in that picture is still here, Maggie. Okay. Maggie I'll say Maggie. Yeah. Maggie. Yeah. So, so I was I'm looking still at, here, and Supervisor Reyes is still the here? only two still here in that picture. I didn't see him in that picture. Maybe he was he had hair, probably. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> are, we but, still, are we still on the record? Oh. Cruel. Okay. Yes, we're still on the record. We're still on the record. I, I don't mind saying that. I won't say that. that, that I don't mind saying that better. But it was a great event, and, and everybody's excited, and, you know, it, it's going to be bringing a lot and changing Yuma County with this new port of entry that will. It will be five years of growing pains. It's going to be a five-year construction project. So we'll, we'll get the brunt of the complaints being in San Luis, uh, but. So the, the redoing the uh, the current original? It's being tore down completely. Okay. 16 oh, new good. lanes, 16 new lanes coming northbound. Pedestrian, it's gonna be the first port of entry in the United States that's gonna be, what do you guys call it, low zero? No, green, completely green. Zero emissions, so that was an extra grant, $30 million additional was provided, so everything is gonna be reused water, Electricity, solar panels, so it's going to be the first port of entry, green, zero. That's a big deal. Good. That's a big deal. That, that helped us get into the... On North America, and, I mean, I mean the nor our northern border. First port of entry, yeah. Yeah, both sides. Both. So they're saying this is going to be the model for them to come and view wow. this when it's done. So don't need at least always need in the news for good things, so, so <laughs> anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> no. um, motion to adjourn? Adjourn. Motion uh, that we adjourn. We adjourn. I vote, I vote no. All right, we're adjourned. <laughs>